Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today. We will discuss advancing global cellular IoT through SGP32, eSIM, iSIM, and Lightweight M2M. Before we get started, just a quick word about who we are. IOTRIP is an award-winning IoT software company that enables organizations to quickly and efficiently manage their IoT devices. We do this through interoperability and through Lightweight M2M. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. As you have probably noticed, the webinar is being recorded and we'll send a recording of the webinar to you along with the slides after the webinar. You're also muted, but that does not mean that we don't want your participation. We've asked for questions, um, considering the format of this webinar being more panel discussion oriented, and we'd love to continue to receive your questions. So if you have others that you have not yet had a chance to send in, please feel free to do that throughout the session through the, the chat for the Q&A session afterward. For today's agenda, we'll discuss an overview of remote SIM profiles and GSMA SGP32 and SGP02 specifications. We'll also discuss the benefits and challenges of updating remote SIM profiles, the business impact of these challenges, an overview of markets that could benefit the most, and implementing a unified platform for device management, connectivity, and remote SIM profile management. Today's panelists and speakers include Christoph from IOTRA. We have Loic from Keegan, who is the SVP of product, marketing, of product and Marketing. We have Wasim, who is the Principal Analyst uh, from Tech Insights. And we have Stefan, who is the Mobile Connectivity Solutions Marketing Director from TALIS. So Wasim will start the session and he will give you an overview of remote SIM profiles and GSMA SGP32 and SGP02 specifications. Wasim. Thanks, Mackenzie. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, happy to be here. I'm very excited and I'm sure you uh, as well are excited to listen to the the new technology, uh, eSIM and iSIM, uh, and uh, especially uh, the course, uh, it has started changing slowly but surely in uh, the IoT space. Today, uh, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I would like to touch upon, uh, uh, from a very high level uh, perspective, a few definitions because uh, there are terms and, te and, and terminologies which we use uh, quite often, but uh, uh, somehow didn't get the context uh, where we are using it for what uh, we are using it, uh, then going and talking about the, the cellular IoT space, uh, the, the, how is the market doing in, 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 uh, from an from a eSIM, iSIM uh, perspective. Then uh, I would like to touch upon the evolution of eSIM, iSIM from a GSMA specification uh, angle so that we all know from where we are coming, uh, where we are going, and how the market uh, definite, um, would react or uh, would grow accordingly uh, in, 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 for, for in, in terms of eSIM and iSIM. Um, and then lastly, I would touch upon the uh, some of the research highlights from Tech Insights, where we uh, provide uh, some uh, a lot of research on IoT, uh, eSIM, uh, low power wide area network, and uh, other related topics. Before we go into the content, uh, I'm sure uh, some of you might not be aware of Tech Insights. So just briefly on Tech Insights, we are a um, a Canadian uh, company based uh, at out at Ottawa in Canada, but uh, with a with a global presence. Uh, uh, people working uh, remotely as well as uh, different uh, locations, as you can see on the, on the map. 
what we do uh, basically tech insights is the most trusted source of actionable in depth intelligence and we cover uh, two sides of it. Uh, one of the major part, what we do is re reverse engineering, which means that we teared up, uh, apart all the chips and and modules and uh, uh, mobile phones, for example, and other um, devices to see what is inside and then uh, and then tell our audience to uh, how to react to the new innovation, what to change what are the business strategies uh, you can adapt out of uh, this and uh, what we take pride in is the speed with which we do because uh, we we also look at the market uh, side of it we cover automotive telecoms consumer electronics and other related uh, markets and uh, we also take pride in the in the way we provide this information in a unique platform uh, what you can also uh, experience yourself uh, if you um, want to have a have a quick look uh, go to the website uh, at www.techinsights.com and then you will uh, can get a feel of uh, what uh, what the platform is all about okay then uh, let's get started in in terms of um, definitions so it's always uh, about, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, technology, uh, technologies which uh, which uh, bring or throw to us a lot of terms and terminologies. And then um, most of the time we are overwhelmed by all these terms, but no need uh, of this because we don't uh, want you or even we don't want to understand all the terms and uh, terminologies, but it's really important uh, to understand the context in which you are using that specific term or terminology. In terms of eSIM, iSIM, it's very important to understand uh, whether, for example, we are talking about the form factor eSIM, iSIM, or we are talking about the GSMA, EUICC, eSIM complete solution, which means that uh, now uh, with this, you have the capability of ha storing multiple network profiles. You can remotely uh, monitor and provision uh, your profiles and do over the air uh, updates and uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the major difference here is, of course, you would uh, see that uh, we use uh, some of these terms interchangeably because uh, our eSIM, uh, which is an embedded SIM, uh, which is the chip shouldered on 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 your on on your PCB in, in the device, comes also in different form factors. But at, it's not necessarily uh, that uh, eSIM is also EUICC uh, capable, which means that uh, it has the capability of storing multiple network profiles and remotely changing uh, the profile. So, uh, and uh, similar with uh, ICM, which is the integrated SIM, uh, which uh, is a part of the SOC and uh, has uh, is uh, is enclaved in a secure uh, element as a secure element and a temper resistant element in, in the SOC is also uh, if uh, if it's used in combination with the DSMA specification, which means if you are using it uh, as EIUICC, which means that it is capable of uh, the network profile uh, management and provisioning remotely and storing multiple prof um, profiles at the same time. There are different terms which you will hear uh, during the presentation and the discussion uh, today, but uh, I think uh, as we go along, you will also uh, find out that uh, the, 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 it's easy to understand once you understand the context, how uh, you are using uh, these uh, different terms. Just to highlight uh, another term which you would hear in today's uh, presentation and discussion is uh, the the latest addition into the 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 last release SGP32. Uh, the IoT eSIM specification is EIM, which is uh, an eSIM remote manager. Uh, it replaces uh, any in, uh, interaction uh, between uh, the device and uh, the S SMDP plus to 
trigger any profile downloads uh, from there, which was not the case uh, previously, which we will uh, talk about in the next uh, slides. Before we uh, go and talk about the evolution and the specification, now as we understand the context, we should also now uh, see that uh, we, we have a different view of the market at, at once, because if we talking about uh, eSIM and iSIM as a form, as a form factor, you would see a lot of data in the market uh, uh, coming uh, from that perspective, which is of course different from uh, what you uh, what you see here. Uh, you have uh, two billion uh, IoT devices last year, and out of these, sixteen percent are, which is around. 300 plus a million uh, devices which are really RSP capable, which which you can remotely uh, you can monitor and manage uh, the uh, the profiles, and uh, this gives you a good uh, understanding of uh, how where we are. Of course, it's growing, but we are still uh, far away from uh, from a widespread uh, deployments or implementation of of these uh, RSP EUICC eSIM. Uh, capable uh, devices. And this brings me to, of course, uh, we have to now uh, look at it and see from an, uh, a specification or standards uh, perspective, why we, uh, why is the need, uh, wh what are the differences, what are the benefits of different um, specifications. Of course, it started uh, with M2M because uh, that is, that's where uh, most of the automotive uh, manufacturers, the OEMs, and the MNOs uh, wanted to have something so that uh, they can uh, use it for their uh, implementation, IoT implementation, and that's where M2M uh, eSIM standard came into being in 2014, going to consumer in 2016, and uh, this year we uh, and GSMA released the IoT eSIM specification, which is uh, still uh, waiting for the test and uh, trial and uh, and uh, the uh, the the architect release in in end of this year and commercial solution would be coming out in 2025 uh, yeah so here the the one thing which uh, we should uh, be highlighting is the diff why is the need of IoT eSIM standard of course M2M is there but if uh, in my discussions with the enterprises uh, it's always a limitation because it's not uh, covering the the low power wide area devices. It's not um, having a simple integration. There is a very complex integration between subscription and subscription management, secure routing, SMSR, and subscription management data preparation. Um, SMDP, which is uh, which is uh, getting away with the IoT eSIM uh, standard. Same, uh, some of, but uh, just to um, see the perspective of how these three uh, specifications are uh, are combined together. So if we go uh, to the next slide, then you will see that. Actually, IoT eSIM specification are taking the best of both M2M and consumer. A specification to so all the remote provisioning is actually taken from uh, the consumer uh, specification. The only difference here is that now uh, in the in the consumer specification, you need a user to to uh, you know change uh, the profiling and uh, and it is user initiated. But in the IoT specification, it is remotely done. And this is uh, this is uh, one of the biggest uh, benefits. So there is simple integration. You can have the support of uh, of low power uh, wide area devices, which are uh, which are basically uh, important for massive uh, IoT implementation. Of course, there are some challenges and uncertainties. But as I said, uh, once we have some commercial solutions out there uh, in two, uh, 2025, then the new deployments, IoT deployments, will should be uh, working with the IoT eSIM specification. So, and now it gives a totally different view on the market. So you see, we we would be going from uh, from uh, uh, two billion to six point six billion in. Uh, 2030, and out of these, 36% will be RSP capable, which is 
uh, good growth uh, and this will change uh, definitely after we will have the commercial solutions in 2025, uh, which is based on the eSIM IoT uh, specification, then this will look very different. So there would be more uh, deployments, there would be more devices uh, would, uh, which will be uh, working with the IoT eSIM specification and it will be uh, the game changer for mass massive IoT uh, deployments. And this, and this brings me to the my last uh, slide, which is some of the research highlights, uh, which uh, which uh, is uh, interesting uh, for you. Uh, if you uh, can visit the website, you can always uh, ha have a free user account and look into the uh, look into the different insights and blog post, which is uh, there uh, on on the website. And. Uh, you can always uh, email me uh, if you want to have an offline uh, discussion. Uh, feel free to email me and uh, I, I would be happy to have a chat uh, with you. With that, I would uh, bring uh, the control to Mackenzie again for the panel discussion. Thank you, Basim. All right, so I hope that that gives a good overview of the market and the topics that we'll be discussing today. And so with that, we'll jump into the panel discussion. So I've already uh, covered who is going to speak today, but at this point, I'll allow the, the panelists to give a brief introduction of themselves and, and their background. Christoph, do you want to start? Yes, with pleasure. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Christophe. I'm uh, head of product here at IoT Europe. Uh, I'm handling um, so all the product aspects of IoT Europe, including the device management platform and the counterpart on the device side. So all the solutions embedded at uh, device level as well. All right. So uh, continue then. Uh, I'm uh, Loïc Bonvalet. I'm uh, working for Kigan since uh, 2018. And I'm the SVP of product and marketing, so uh, helping our customer uh, leveraging our product and solution. Uh, I'm based in the south of France. Nice to nice to be here with you guys. So I guess it's my turn. I'm Stefan. Uh, hello, everybody. So um, I'm very glad to be here, and thanks, Mackenzie, and thanks, uh, for for having me here. So I'm. Um, uh, I work for Thales. I'm in charge of uh, embedded products, um, uh, for eSIM and uh, embedded secure elements for consumer and IoT, and also um, marketing for IoT services. So I uh, hope uh, we'll be able to bring you uh, interesting insights on the, on these markets. All right, well, let's jump into the panelist uh, discussion questions. So the first one that uh, we can address is, what are IoT enterprises saying about the current approach to eSIM? So maybe I can start. Um, well, I, as a, as a head of marketing for, for, for eSIM and IoT solutions, um, well, I, I meet uh, many Many customers and many stakeholders in this in this market. So, like Wasim explained in his presentation, uh, so cellular is uh, uh, pretty big uh, in IoT. Uh, however, the, uh, the the penetration of the remote SIM provisioning, what the eSIM brings to you, is still uh, not not so so big. Um, I think you mentioned sixteen percent Wasim. And um, when uh, when we look at uh, what enterprises are looking for uh, when they, they decide to use uh, cellular connectivity, uh, for instance, they say, um, I've heard from a large uh, global smart metering company, I provide a global connectivity to my customers, but some of them want to use a local connectivity. So I wish I could use a single SIM. So that's something that typically you can answer with the eSIM technology. Uh, and the machine-to-machine -machine one that was created almost 10 years ago for that. However, this, this the same company says, uh, I want to use narrowband IoT because I'm into water metering and I want to use battery-powered uh, devices. 
And here, it seems for M2M -M does not work. So there's an incompatibility uh, between these two technologies. Uh, others like uh, uh, aircraft manufacturers say, I want to use local connectivity whenever my product, the aircraft, lands in a non-COVID country because I need to, to consolidate uh, uh, information, to, to collect information about the flight and uh, what happened during the flight. Or also uh, on the connectivity side, uh, you have IoT players, uh, connectivity providers saying, I want to optimize my cost, but it's super slow to actually extend my network of partners uh, when I use the SIM M2M technology. So you, you, we see that the, the, the technology that has been created almost 10 years ago does not fit with all uh, the needs of these companies. And they're really asking for a change. Maybe I'll complement a bit uh, the Stefan's answer, uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, you have also uh, some international deployment which have uh, some specific regulatory requirements in some countries. I can think of uh, uh, Brazil, of Turkey, and ESIM here also answer this challenge uh, of uh, basically allowing to uh, deploy a local profile, which is a regulatory requirement, for example, for devices staying in Turkey permanently. Uh, so that's, that's an important point. And uh, I think here, yeah, the evolution of, uh, of eSIM in the standard is really there to serve to address the shortcomings of the preview specification, right? So LP1 support is a big one, removal of SMS dependencies, uh, ability to support uh, transfer over NB IoT. And I think Kian, for example, is, is, is leading the working group uh, around, the, around ECM IoT, the so-called GSMA working group seven. And so uh, the approach there is really to work jointly with the hardware makers, right? the people who have manufacturing and deployment challenges uh, to find a pragmatic solution and make the standard evolve in the right and usable direction. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, one fundamental philosophy of, uh, of the, this next generation uh, of IoT ISP in the way it's uh, discussed and implemented with uh, the companies who can supply in there and, and also the end users. Yes, and I, I think, uh, uh, Stefan Fortel is speaking, so uh, I, I think it's also fair to say that the the, the machine to machine uh, eSIM standard that was uh, designed uh, quite some time ago is, is rather a um, mobile network operator or, or telco centric, or telco oriented, if you wish, um, in the way it has been designed. So that's something that you cannot really change uh, once the technology is deployed because it it has to be implemented this way. Uh, and that's uh, that's uh, probably one of the shortcomings uh, in addition to the uh, the uh, narrowband IoT shortcoming that you, you mentioned, Loic, um, that is also um, a reality and, and, and really fell as a limitation by enterprises today. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Stefan was saying, uh, just to Vasim here, just to add on uh, this. It is, uh, we also have, need to understand that the IoT standard is not backward compatible with the M2M uh, standard, which means there's no migration to, if you are thinking as an enterprise, which I uh, come across in my conversation with uh, some of the bigger enterprises that uh, you are not, moving forward with the M2M standard anyways. Of course, the, the existing deployments would be there and uh, it would continue till uh, until the end of life because uh, as we all know, M2M deployments uh, are the, the long life deployments, uh, whether it's automotive or industrial uh, use cases. And, uh, and um, so that's why the, the new deployments, the new IoT, uh, deployments would be, uh, I hope that it would uh, rather make use of the new IoT eSIM specification than uh, the, the older 
once. Okay, thank you all for your contributions. We'll move on to the next question, which is how can the new IoT eSIM SGB32 standard be a game changer for organizations? Maybe I can start. So I was mentioning that here, yeah, some of the philosophy uh, used for designing this new standard. And, and I think uh, one of the key goal is definitely support new uh, type of deployment, notably over IP1 network, which are, for example, critical in some verticals such as metering, uh, reaching high power efficiency, uh, removing the complexity of M2M deployment. We mentioned that earlier. Uh, that was a really important criteria as well. And also, I would say, introducing flexibility in the deployment model. So, for example, the EIM, uh, this uh, new functionality, which is, I would say, the equivalent of the former SMSR uh, in the M2M specification, is, is uh, not subject to hard constraint, at least for now, in terms of deployment. That is that depending on the use case, the level of security, etc., companies can choose to either uh, source from a supplier or develop their own and host it uh, in various data center or in cloud, right? So there is, I would say, inclusion of this flexibility of deployment uh, into the standard, which I think is really positive because that means uh, more people can offer this uh, type of solutions uh, and at various, I would say, uh, quality, security uh, levels and pricing, which uh, I think is, uh, is good for the health of uh, this marketplace. Uh, I agree with you, Loïc. I think um, coming back to what I said just before, the previous model was uh, telco-oriented, and now the new one is really enterprise-oriented because this change in the technology makes it easier for the enterprise to be in control of what they want to achieve. So be it for the initial uh, mobile subscription they want to deploy in their devices, either on the field uh, or uh, when the device is being manufactured, which is also possible, um, or when they want to change the connectivity for some reason, because they want better coverage, because the devices are moving, um, because um, um, they get uh, a better deal for uh, another partner, or because they are themselves providing some connectivity services and they want to increase the number of partners they work with. and. With this, they they really, with this technology, they're really able to focus on um, the business aspects, uh, meaning searching for the, the 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 best partners they want to work with, um, working on uh, how they want to deploy their own solution, focusing on their their core values, uh, instead of entering into technical complexities, projects, integration projects that they need to. To conduct before when when we you, you were using the ECM M2M um, technology they were, they were forced to enter into. So here it's no longer um, it's no longer needed. So that means uh, you have at the end of the day it's really about increasing your business agility. And I think that's super important. And when I say it's it's uh, enterprise oriented, I'm not opposing as well. Um, mobile network operators, IoT solution providers, and so on and so forth. And, and even the, the the mobile network operators benefit from this uh, from this new approach. Because like I like I said, they can easily work with uh, new partners um, as they as they uh, leverage this technology. All right, thank you for your answers. We'll move on to the next question, which is how does eSIM change the manufacturing of cellular devices compared to SIMs? Okay, so I might start with that one. Uh, Mackenzie, you could uh, show the slide 34 towards that, uh, that we created. But uh, one of the uh, 
that has been one of the central topic of discussion with uh, you know interested parties again in the hardware space right is they were facing already specific you know uh, challenges and issues when uh, they started to connect their existing product and i come back again to the, the metering case but it's also true in logistics etc the fact that you were introducing connectivity with cellular was introducing a new set of uh, things to address, for example, simple as physical insertion of a plastic seam into a device. Well, it does take time and effort manually, right? It is a, a, a logistical uh, issue that needs to be addressed, and it's not necessarily in line with, you know, the classical uh, semiconductor manufacturing that you find, which is you take a, a PCB, and you pick and place component automatically with a, with a manufacturing chain, et cetera. Now, if uh, companies want to address a cellular device with eSIM embedded in there, uh, we remove this plastic uh, and manual insertion management, uh, but we have to deal with the provisioning of those eSIM uh, for uh, the devices and for the deployment. And here you have really several ways to address that. You can uh, anticipate, I would say, with, for example, the set of connectivity that is going to be mostly used for specific deployments. So for example, I deploy in the US, I'm going to use a Verizon or AT&T primarily, and I can create uh, a specific part number, an SKU, uh, with that connectivity already baked in. Uh, that's one example. The other approach is you select a kind of a neutral bootstrap uh, to be uh, able to uh, load uh, the right connectivity when the device is connected in the field. Uh, this approach might create a specific uh, challenge for battery powered devices. Uh, for example, single charge battery powered devices, that is a device that goes in the field and we'll have a single battery for, the, for its lifetime, you might want not to consume any battery until the device is fully deployed. So in that case, for example, you could think of a um, uh, deployment mechanism where you have a test devices to check the network connectivity at the point of installation. And then based on this test result, you will provision, so for example, through a companion device, uh, the right connectivity profile at the time of installation. So, but you can see in the different scenarios is uh, you really have to work through the use cases and work through the installation uh, chain uh, of each device and each use case. And if I put that simply at a high level, it's to optimize things and to reduce the number of SKUs of part number that a device maker has to make, we try to anticipate as much as possible the inclusion of security in a generic part number SKU, that is we have an eSIM uh, which is ready to go, ready to be used and loaded with the right connectivity. And we try to defer as much as possible the connectivity loading to when the information is available. That is we know where the device is gonna go, where it's gonna be deployed, what's the signal strength at this uh, place. And based on that, you can decide, okay, I want to use a bootstrap approach or a, or a final connectivity approach, but uh, we have a lot of this discussion uh, in, uh, in our customer discussion nowadays on, on this manufacturing and how to optimize it effectively. Yeah, so Loki mentioned a number of options and I think it's, it's the way um, the, the, the IoT market is structured that leads to these multiple options. Um, because it really depends on uh, what kind of devices you want to deploy, where, uh, how many uh, in terms of uh, volumes, how many are you going to sell or to ship to the US or or to France or to Germany, or et cetera. So I think it makes a lot of sense to have uh, all these options available. Um, the Certainly so GP32 is uh, compatible with all of these options. And that's that's very very important. Um, I, I could add also that some um, some customers say, some enterprises say, 
when the device leaves my my factory, I want it to be complete. Uh, it's not so. It's not necessarily because they have a battery uh, constraints that they want it to be provisioned with the with the connectivity it will use um, in the field, because they want to be sure uh, actually that everything is in order. Um, so that's that's uh, that's a possible uh, uh, strategy um, to they can apply. And I think the also the neutral uh, bootstrap is very interesting, even especially when you have lower volumes because. You can have one SKU for uh, almost the entire world, and then you will localize the device when it uh, arrives uh, uh, where it needs to be deployed. So that's uh, that's for sure very very interesting. You, Christoph, here maybe yeah to try to, to summarize everything here. Actually, you're both right. Like one size doesn't fit all. Like you really need to take care about what is your product. Uh, what is the capability of your product? Is it battery centered or not? Uh, is your eSIM capable of onboarding one or several profiles from the start? Um, where do you want to deploy it? Do you want to deploy it in one country or several countries? Do you want in each country to have one single connectivity provider or several? Uh, and then based on all of these aspects and probably more, uh, you need to to define uh, what is the the target solution you will adopt. the The only thing uh, that is sure is that your device your device when when shipped needs to onboard some kind of connectivity from the start, either um, like the definitive uh, connectivity uh, or uh, as uh, as uh, Loic and Stefan mentioned, uh, some sort of a, a bootstrap that can connect and and get the the final uh, connectivity uh, provider. And maybe I would add, uh, sometimes also we deal with uh, devices which support multiple types of connectivity, say in the fixed wireless access domain, for example, right, where you have a 5G gateway uh, offering broadband connectivity to a home or a business. You can have also alternate means to load this initial profile, whether it's bootstrap or final. Uh, but the point that Stefan made around uh, you know, anticipating as much in the factory is really important in the sense that, yeah, you will control things before the device leave your uh, your domain and your company. Once it's out there, right, you really want to make sure that it's been tested to the best of your capabilities uh, because then recovering that device in the field is a costly process. So you want to avoid it as much as possible. All right, so anticipating factory and during the installation, everything that can be done uh, for successful deployment and management afterwards, I think is, is really uh, something that should be top of mind uh, for, for the device maker. I think uh, everybody uh, has uh, covered like almost everything of what uh, you need to listen on this, just to add a very small point, which is uh, most of the times like uh, is either overlooked or ignored is uh, that with, with eSIM, uh, now uh, you are actually producing more and looking at the, uh, the devices which are more future proof because they are now protected from any impact of like any um, network technologies or uh, sunset or any uh, termination of any specific uh, technology or a, a network technology and and um, on top of it uh, eliminating any technical uh, lock in or or uh, operator lock in which which in itself uh, would impact your TCO uh, for sure and uh, your device are manufactured uh, to be used for uh, for a longer period of time which is uh, which is a uh, plus point okay so the next question that we have is what is the connection between device management? application and eSIM management. Okay, maybe I can I can start on this one, uh, Christopher Tayot Europe. Uh, so now that we don't have plastic uh, 
sims anymore so eSIM and iSIM are not a remote component from the device they're part of the device um, and currently for for the the verticals we we touch based on uh, water metering uh, smart cities uh, asset tracking etc uh, there are already some solutions to manage remotely uh, the devices so that we call usually device management platforms uh, or DMPs. Uh, they can perform a lot of things on the device, uh, um, data collection, remote configuration, for instance, or, or, or firmware updates. Um, so when you speak about, when you think about eSIM as part of the device, naturally, um, you think about how uh, to um, reuse uh, these existing channels of device management to control this part of the device, this new part of the device, which is the ESM. Um, so if we go, Mackenzie, please, on slide uh, 48 uh, to illustrate that a bit. Um, so what we can envision, uh, the previous one, please. So probably 47, sorry. Yeah. Um, so what we can envision here is that if you take device management to control or to trigger or to channel um, this remote sim provisioning process, then it's natural actually uh, to reuse the existing channel that exists to funnel that uh, through there. Uh, here we are taking the example of reusing an open standard, uh, which is like to attempt to to do so. So we will interact basically the main components of uh, RSP, uh, namely the EIM and the IPA, and funnel it through. Uh, things that already exist. Uh, and currently the, the SGP32 um, specification already enables that. Uh, so then on the next slide, we can see the, the objects uh, that, have been that has been created um, at uh, uh, Open Mobile Alliance uh, level uh, to handle that. Uh, so this is the, the source code of the object and the, it is already there and, and ready to do so. Yeah, maybe just to complement a bit this answer there, I think already the standards does provide uh, flexibility in the way the data related to EC management is transported. And I think it's coming back to the use case and the use case constraints. Right? There is ways to leverage, uh, for example, joint transport. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, really a positive development. And I think... Uh, a good translation of the philosophy that was adopted for this standard, it's, it's less constrained and less telco only focused. All right, move on to the next question, which is why perform RSP through device management channels rather than from connectivity management portals? notably in cases of LP1 networks. Okay, so I, um, maybe I'll start again on, on this one. It's it quite linked to the to the previous one. Um, as, as Rick just mentioned, it's a bit less uh, telco-centric. So first, why using device management platforms rather than connectivity management platform? Uh, so yeah, remote sim provisioning is a telco thing. So you could imagine that an MNO uh, could be uh, involved or it's quite natural for an MNO to do that, but will they really do that? <laughs> Given that uh, basically when you are performing an RSP, you are moving out from this MNO. So you are basically churning. So uh, the, 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 the fact of doing it through uh, device management rather than connectivity management is to free yourself uh, from vendor lock-in. And I think this is a bit the, file, the philosophy of less telco and more enterprise-oriented of the GP32. Um, I think this is particularly true if you want to operate in several countries, if you want to have or to set um, um, automated profile uh, allocations uh, depending on uh, geography, uh, where a device is, or a signal strength, or whatever, uh, I think this is key uh, there. The second aspect I think is simplicity. Um, as there is a lot of flexibility in the, the specification, uh, 
depending on the MNO, maybe this is not exactly the same implementation. So having an abstraction through device management uh, can bring simplicity and can bring you a bit more um, uh, based on the benefits that they bring on transport, as Loic mentioned, or the data model used, or um, additional security. RSP is quite secure by itself, but you could add layers on top of it. Um, so basically, there is a lot of, uh, of new benefits there. And the, the third thing, and I will stop there, um, if we want to tackle the, the constraint networks part, um, device management, uh, and especially uh, the one uh, that we named before, Lightweight like M2M, is really um, highly optimized to handle uh, LP1 networks, uh, latency, uh, retransmissions, network, network interruptions. Uh, all of these aspects are quite well handled uh, through the, the transport protocol. Uh, so basically, doing an RSP would be quite similar to doing a firmware update. And we could reuse uh, all the the features of the protocol to, for instance, um, pause or resume uh, the, the RSP process without having to restart everything from scratch if everything goes wrong, if like the device goes to sleep or the device uh, loses its connectivity during the process. So uh, I think all of the reasons I, I, I gave up there, I think it's, uh, yeah, to, to, to explain why uh, DMP could be a, could be a a good suspect to, to perform a RSP there. I, I think I agree with you, uh, Christophe, uh, with what you said. I would just like to come back on the the, the, the MNO uh, position. You mentioned churn um, as a, so, something problematic, potentially. Um, it could be because, uh, well, eSIM uh, by nature allows you to change the connectivity from one provider to another one. However, uh, what we see also when we discuss with the uh, with um, uh, these uh, these uh, uh, mobile network operators, is that they can leverage also this uh, technology, this approach, to just expose their connectivity um, in a different manner to potential customers. So that means uh, the at the end of the day, this increases their reach and their their options uh, to uh, to um, uh, to deploy their uh, connectivity to more customers. That's also an interesting um, position that we see from, uh, from some mobile network operators uh, who uh, believe this is also an opportunity for them, actually, that the industry is moving to uh, SGP32. All right, let's move on to our last panelist question, which is, what advice would you give to IoT stakeholders who want to embrace this technology for their IoT solutions? Uh, I, will, I will start. I think at Thales, what we we've uh, we've seen um, because we've been uh, deploying uh, eSIM and eSIM solutions for many many years now. Um, when it comes to IoT, uh, maybe in the past machine to machine was different because less players, bigger players like car makers, for instance, so they they can invest in, in the technology, in the cellular technology, in the eSIM technology. Uh, at large, but with IoT and the uh, the growth of IoT that Wasim explained, uh, there are more and more uh, different players, smaller players with less capabilities, um, who are interested in having cellular in their in their solutions because cellular brings a lot of uh, of a lot of benefits. Uh, who wants to go for eSIM because it gives more flexibility. So the eSIM for IoT, the GP32 flavor it is, is great uh, for that. It brings uh, definitely a very, very interesting uh, um, uh, simplification to, to uh, eSIM uh, uh, in, uh, in cellular IoT. Um, but we, we also see the um, integration of the eSIM inside the device as uh, requiring some expertise. Um, and by the way, that's why many, many uh, enterprises, they go for uh, cellular modules that they buy because they are, they are totally built, tested, etc., and they know the cellular technology inside works. And we think for the eSIM, it's kind of the same uh, with uh, SGP32. Um, we, we, uh, we have built um, 
what we call a self-contained solution, which includes inside ASIM as much as possible of the uh, uh, SGP32 standard. So the, uh, the integration within the device is, is uh, very simple, which uh, brings, um, which actually frees uh, enterprises from um, being, um, and being uh, forced to acquire new skills, spend time and money into the uh, into the integration of the technology. And just to finish on that, uh, Loic mentioned uh, security uh, at the beginning and uh, baking security in the device uh, at the beginning is very important. That there's also a solution uh, that is called uh, IoT SEP leveraging the ASIM that can do that. And I think that's the same spirit you you bring something that is secure by design to uh, to uh, the, the, the enterprise that is going to design and build a device and manufacture it. So we, you do the same for connectivity. So there, there are really a number of benefits uh, to go for uh, this uh, self-contained solution. So uh, if you're interested in that, we have a TADES Adaptive Connect solution. That's the name of it that you can, uh, that you can, uh, you can uh, review. Uh, that's uh, definitely the spirit of what we've, uh, we've built here. Hmm. Stefan, uh, on my end, uh, so Kigan, Kigan side, uh, I would say yes. We so with with this team, we see a shift of the SIM functionality being sourced through the telco and now moving to the device maker. Right, we are trying to enable a model where the device maker is finding a fit for purpose SIM, eSIM, iSIM for uh, for its devices meeting the requirements. So. Uh, that's really positive because it brings uh, what Stefan mentioned, security by design. You have a secure enclave available for telco, but for other options, uh, notably the uh, applicative security and, and a stronger and better experience, which, by the way, uh, is going to be more and more regulated by the states, the government, Europe, USA, etc. have already schemes in place to raise the bar on IoT security. Uh, so... The advices I would give is what I mentioned earlier, anticipate the manufacturing question early on, right? Because it's easier to do as much as possible in your factory during the deployment than in the field after. Uh, defer as much as possible the connectivity profile loading. So it's really, you're gonna load only the connectivity profile that you're gonna need in the field for these specific devices. And Kian is working heavily on that. Uh, if you if you have use cases which are very constrained, hard constrained, the battery, LP1 networks, regulatory, right? Uh, a good anticipation on those aspects, uh, discussing with the suppliers is, is really important, and notably if the devices are long lived in the field. And finally, I would say, yes, there is an ecosystem of supplier in this space, right? Uh, you have some companies uh, in this panel, definitely. And, and so, I would encourage the OEM to really uh, have interaction between the suppliers uh, that they select so that they really try to jointly optimize usage, such as, uh, for example, uh, optimize transport for EC management that's achievable between DM and RSP. And that should be uh, uh, really considered. So, um, thank you, Luke. It's great transition. So I, I think you nailed everything here. The, um, so everything should be anticipate, anticipated because uh, one size doesn't fit all and the, the standard is pretty uh, pretty flexible. I would just uh, yeah, say analyze uh, what is your current use case and analyze what is your uh, current tools you have at hand and uh, don't reinvent the wheel. There is uh, some solutions and especially uh, at transport level that are already there. Maybe you are already using them. So leverage on them uh, instead of building um, new tools on the site. Uh, you will, of course, need um, the components uh, that have been exposed uh, by, by Wasim at the beginning. Um, but uh, if you have already uh, device management or transport in place, uh, it's very possible that you can leverage on them to, to perform a recipe. All right, thank you all for your responses. Um, we have a few minutes left uh, before the end of the webinar, so we'll move on now to attendee questions. So these are questions that were submitted um, by people who uh, registered for the webinar, and we'll we'll go through 
we'll go through them. Okay. Thank you, Mackenzie. So um, Olivier, Olivier Carmona joining. Um, so, so we have a question from a, a, a shy attendee uh, uh, asking, um, and I think he, he might have joined late uh, the, the call, asking about um, uh, the remote SIM profile today uh, offered by GSMA SIM standard not being so suitable for battery power devices. Um, is someone from the uh, the panel that wants to answer? I think the, the question has been partially, well, I've been as answered during the, 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 the intro, but uh, someone wants mm -hmm. to take the lead on that? Uh, sure, Olivier. So, um... The RSP Evolution AGP32 is is uh, designed to be really scarce and uh, to be really uh, compatible with these battery powered devices. And and the, the reason is that first of all, it can work on our band IoT network, which are designed for a battery low, very low power uh, devices. Um, and second, um, I think it has, was has been explained also by, by Christophe. And Loic, so the, the transport mechanism to to download the, the profiles, um, they, they are super optimized for for these types of devices and networks. So this is really something that exists. And um, today it's really compatible. And uh, the other aspect of it is that there's uh, the Trusted Connectivity Alliance, which is the alliance of the C makers, if you wish, um, that is working on uh, on. Uh, um, technical recommendations for uh, for ESIM. Uh, they have defined a, ver a smaller profile uh, that can be uh, deployed and that is uh, guaranteed to be interoperable on all the ESIMs. So this is interesting because it also reduces the amount of uh, of uh, data you need to uh, transfer when uh, downloading a, a mobile network operator profile in a device. Yeah. Thanks. So as you mentioned, Stefan, the, the transport is optimized. Um, so if I compare it to a firmware update, uh, when you have a battery power device, the firmware updates should adapt and be less uh, let smaller than for a device that is not battery powered. So the profiles uh, for IoT will be smaller as well. And, uh, and the transport is optimized to handle that. After, it's true that you don't have unlimited slots to perform RSPs. If you perform RSPs every two weeks, then yeah, probably your device will run out quite quickly. So it's uh, it's still something that takes energy, but uh, if you are looking to perform one or two uh, switches during the lifetime of a device, I think it's completely feasible. Thanks. And um, there is also a question that has been uh, raised, but that has been raised by Olivier uh, and Loïc and Sirbach uh, with uh, a very, well, very important answer. The question from Olivier is um, who owns the e-sims and takes the responsibility for it in term proper in term of uh, its functionality. Um, and and Loïc, basically, uh, you answered uh, uh, that. Uh, it, it would depend, uh, it can be the, uh, the, the, the connectivity supplier or it can be the eSIM supplier. And actually, uh, Kigen being an eSIM supplier, uh, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a few things here to, to say and, and, and to propose. Um, Loïc, do you want to, to, to yeah, no. extend? Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, dependent effectively on the the supply chain of the eSIM, right? And maybe in some cases, the device will still be enabled by an eSIM, which is provided by, say, the, the mostly used connectivity provider, right? If you have a, a device that is heavily deployed in one geography or in one country or with a global profile that works for most of the cases, likely it's, it might be good that it comes from, from this uh, connectivity supplier. Uh, but yeah, in the case where the eSIM is already chosen really early on, independently of the, the connectivity that's going to be used and loaded, uh, I think they're definitely there. The, the, the SIM vendor take a more prominent role because they, they need to make sure that uh, the hardware they supply is meeting the requirements, but also that they will support the connectivity profile, which are required at the time of manufacturing and also give an outlook towards, uh, you know, future requirements. Uh, so coming back to the uh, need of anticipation uh, a little bit, in, notably in the targeted geographies and targeted MNOs, 
we might not know everything at the beginning, and that's one of the benefits of eSIM. Uh, but anticipating the targeted geographies is always good because then you you can make sure that you pre-test profiles, for example, uh, on the eSIM and make sure that you have something working well in the field uh, ahead of a massive deployment. Yeah, absolutely. I think it. Don't forget also that the, um, the these products, these eSIM products, they have been certified. So a lot of effort has been made to ensure that they are, they are properly implemented in terms of functionality and security as well. And since um, uh, it's the same for Thales, we sell these hardware products uh, to device makers. So uh, basically, we commit on the quality of uh, what, what we're delivering. So that that's really the change that has been introduced with the EC model when you split uh, the hardware and the, the mobile network operator profile distribution, which is done via these uh, uh, remote SIM provisioning services. So that, that's really clear. And uh, that's really something that is important. And um, leveraging uh, the experience and the background of the uh, of the provider is also super important. Thank you, Stefan. And so we, we had had some previous questions uh, sent uh, by uh, our attendee beforehand. So uh, I'd like to uh, to go over them. So the first question I, I, I want to go over is uh, do the service profiles have to be known by the original MNO and VNO, or can the RSP introduce a new profile? Um, so there, yeah, definitely, you don't need to have anticipated knowledge, right? One of the key benefits against M2M is that uh, uh, you can work even with a blank eSIM, even in the initial deployment, and the, the first profile can be loaded at the time of installation through a companion device or an alternate connectivity or a, or a cable, right? So yeah, that's definitely flexible in the same way that you uh, can take a smartphone, eSIM enabled with no connectivity to start. And depending on the manufacturer on the phone, it can enable various customer journey to select, I want this connectivity or that connectivity. Uh, you have now the same capability for IoT device with IoT RSP. Thank you. Another question uh, is, uh, do we see my SIM solutions for an urban IoT network depend on telco operators to implement it or said differently? Uh, can I use eSIM iSIM on any urban IoT network? Um, there, I would say the spec, the IoT SP spec is designed again for this LP1 and NB IoT network compatibility. Now, when you test completely the, the solution and the deployment, uh, you might have a, a, a variance in, for example, the NB IoT parameters supported by this or that network. So in effect, nothing beats, I would say, uh, a field test with the with the targeted connectivity profile uh, before massive deployment, uh, because that's where you're going to clean pipe, I would say, your deployment completely. Uh, but at least uh, the spec is really built with that uh, requirement in mind. This is maybe also where the choice of transport is important and maybe can abstract uh, these little differences in some cases. So, but normally, yeah. Should not be any problem. Thank you, Christophe. Um, there is a, a, another question, which is why can't we install a blank now on IoT eSIM or iSIM in a digital water meter and select the telco based on the best radio signal strength at the time of meter installation at the customer's property? Oh, okay, um, that's an interesting one. That's one of the options we discussed previously. When we, we want to deploy a device, if it is not equipped with uh, connectivity at all, um, why not choosing the, be the best connectivity at the, uh, the, the location where the device is going to be deployed? That's super important, I think, for a smart meter that won't, that won't move. Um, of course, it is possible to do that. Um, you can use this companion device that is equipped with a connectivity that uh, can, the field technician can use to scan the available networks and and select uh, the, the the proper one um 
the, uh, the, the other way would be to use uh, these um, generic uh, connectivity, the bootstrap uh, subscription. Uh, you, you may have heard about this term already, which is a classic subscription, mobile subscription that provides uh, connectivity usually in roaming. Uh, so you can connect to any network that is available where the device is going to be deployed. So that's, that's an interesting way of solving the issue as well. Uh, however, it could be a bit expensive because when you buy a mobile subscription, well, you pay for it, whether you use it or not. So there are alternatives to that, uh, like uh, uh, innovative uh, technologies to uh, innovative services to provide a similar connectivity, uh, but just um, for the download of this uh, uh, final uh, subscription that you want. So uh, at Thales, we have developed one also, uh, which is uh, uh, basically a per-per-use solution where you, you pay only when you use the connectivity. Uh, and usually that's just once for a given device. So it's definitely possible and you have uh, different ways of using it. I think that the one that I've just uh, described uh, that, that we provide at Thales is a uh, is interesting in terms of TCO. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. Um, there is a question also about what's the status of iSIM inclusion into wireless chipset modules? Um, maybe I can comment comment on uh, this. Of course, this is uh, this is something very uh, which is uh, getting traction from a couple of. Chipset uh, manufacturers uh, and semicon companies, uh, but there are there are very few companies who are actually working and uh, have already released. Also, I would say some of the iSIM uh, chips uh, uh, and top of my mind, uh, Sony semiconductors, which is the former Altair uh, uh, based in Israel have a couple of uh, IoT iSIM uh, chips uh, in in uh, and they they are really working on this um, very actively uh, other other suppliers uh, i would say uh, sequence a uh, french company which has been taken over by by Renesis uh, quite recently are, uh, are also working and have uh, have uh, released some of the IoT iSIM uh, chips uh, in the market. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, Stefan would would uh, would uh, comment on this that uh, they they are working with Qualcomm uh, together on, on but on the consumer side. Yes, indeed, indeed, uh, we have we announced a certified product with Qualcomm the, earlier this year, but that's for the consumer uh, market. Thank you. Um, so Olivier Léger uh, had uh, uh, com complemented his, uh, his question uh, and had the discussion with Loïc, and I think that uh, it, it's an interesting point uh, brought. Uh, so I don't, I didn't see your answer, Loïc, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Olivier about the, the, the legal complexity induced by the, uh, the usage of uh, eSIM and iSIM inside the process of, connect of the connection to, uh, to, 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 uh, to a communication channel. Um, Louis, do you want to add to, 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 to that point? Yeah, uh, sure. Because... So I think it's a very good point, uh, I would say, from Olivier, uh, in the sense that, yes, you have to pay attention in the early agreements uh, between the supply chain players on how to deal with issues in the field. I think that's really important. Uh, we, we have had, uh, in the case of ICIM, this discussion. Uh, which can be quite long and complex uh, uh, when we work with the various partners, but that's in the early stage of the supply chain that is working with, say, the chipset makers such as uh, Altair and Sequence, working with the big uh, network operators who want to have a nice thing strategy but are very demanding in terms of quality and legal agreements, right? So. We work through that, but I would say this is not necessarily the visible part of the iceberg towards the integrator, right? Uh, we try to have a, uh, towards the integrator, very straightforward licensing agreements. Uh, and, and then, yeah, effectively stand back uh, behind our, 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 our products 
and when uh, when there is an issue, because there is always sometimes uh, you know an issue here and there in specific network condition in specifics. Uh, so we know it's going to happen. Uh, we need to stand by ready to support the customer and work through the supply chain until it's very clear. Is it an hardware issue? Is it a software issue? It's a combination of both. Could be related to connectivity profile. But I would say this is something that the SIM industry and the telco slash chipset and module provider knows pretty well, right? We've been working through that already in the past. When you have a customer calling, I don't have connectivity on my device, you need to pull on the wire and, and debug layer by layer the, the onion effectively. And depending on the, the, the customer, he might approach via support channel, maybe through the telco, maybe through its module vendor, maybe both at the same time. Uh, it, it's really testing effectively the capacities of support of the different companies. And, and that's where you might have a better performance than, uh, than others. <laughs> so, that's that's part of the differentiation also among the among the suppliers and the reputation they have in in, in the market there. Right, absolutely, yeah, and I think that question is totally legit. Um, don't don't forget that in the consumer space, I think the question of hardware issues, debugging uh, with a component that is soldered inside a bigger device, well, is the same actually, and uh, it, uh, the AC has been deployed in uh, hundreds of millions already. On the field, um, the usage is uh, increasing very, very fast. Uh, so uh, I think, um, yeah, we can. We're not saying everything is easy. Uh, that that's okay. But the problems are already addressed and I think solved. This is a point of attention for you. Um, but uh, nothing that is that cannot be solved. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a question, uh, a quick question, I think, which is, uh, can we adapt our product for ECMIC uh, coming from, from, from a device manufacturer, obviously? So if the, if the question is, can we backport uh, ECM capabilities into an existing device? So obviously, ICM, no. <laughs> it would be quite complicated. Uh, ECM capabilities could be done replacing the plastic SIM card in it and putting a plastic SIM card that is reprogrammable. Mm -hmm. So this is theoretically feasible, but I imagine quite complex in terms of logistics, especially if you have a, a big fleet of devices or if devices are quite remote or quite difficultly accessible. But of course you won't probably embed a SIM, or a knee SIM or an iSIM uh, on the PCB of, a, of an existing device. Mackenzie, I let you um, the floor for the final words. Okay. Well, that's um, that's all of the questions that we have um, for today uh, for our session. If there are questions that have been asked that haven't been answered uh, during the session, I'll try to follow up individually to make sure that you had your your question asked. Thank you to our panelists who uh, shared their time with us today. And thank you very much for you um, who have stayed uh, until the end past the hour that we had planned. So I hope you found the discussion interesting and thank you for your time. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.